and it felt like the, like the sidewalk had opened up under my feet because I realized that it, my argument was wrong. You have to find a problem that um, you can do, but not everybody else can do. I, f I think that about all the other people I discuss math with, that they're thinking much faster than I am. Oh my gosh, is that the reason that you speak so fast and explain math so fast? <laughs> so that's how it goes. I mean, the foundations are sort of what you fill in afterwards. What's work? Not too much. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's pretty, pretty easy life. Welcome to Math Life Balance. Today, our guest is Mark Levin, a Humboldt professor at the University of Duisburg Essen, working in algebraic geometry and motivic homotopy theory, and also my PhD advisor. So, welcome, Mark. I'm very happy to see you. <laughs> and yeah, to, ask to see you too. It's been a while. <laughs> nice to see you. So, I'm, I'm no longer Humboldt professor. That was a temporary uh, notation, oh. but uh, it was fun while it lasted. Oh, sorry. <laughs> right. um, so, may I ask what brought you into mathematics? Oh, yeah. I mean, it goes back a long way. I didn't, I was, you know, as a kid, I was always interested in science more like chemistry and physics and astronomy and that kind of thing. And um, had a great calculus class my last year in high school. It was a pretty intense thing. It was two hours a day and the teacher was really good. And uh, yeah, he wrote on one of my exams that he hopes I would become a mathematician, which was first uh, thought I had of doing that. And I didn't really uh, think of it at the time, but uh, yeah, I took more and more math courses and just kind of snowballed. It was kind of the thing that was easiest for me compared to all the other sciences. So I took physics, biochemistry, chemistry, all those things, and they were all kind of fun. But um, after an explosion in the uh, chemistry lab that I caused, I decided this was maybe not the thing for me. Because <laughs> <laughs> nobody got hurt, so. <laughs> <laughs> and um yeah just one thing led to another and then um yeah so i mean it really wasn't until sort of the middle of my uh phd studies that i really in some sense finally decided that that's what i would do it was always a hesit hesitation and i gather that your parents are probably not mathematicians is no, it? no, not at all. No. So how did they react to such a choice? Was oh, they were they were happy about it. I think um, you know, the standard wish for some for such a family is that uh, you know science-minded son becomes a doctor. So uh, that didn't happen, but um, I think they were you know pretty happy <laughs> with the way my career went. So. And how does your own family perceive? Your job? Oh, let's see. Oh, I mean, uh, they, you know, perceive it at a, at a distance. I don't think they really have a clear idea of what's, what goes on. You know, they see, I mean, now, now we don't travel so much, but before they saw that I was traveling a lot. So they thought that was nice. And um, I mean, it was always kind of mysterious to them what actually I was doing. We kind of explain it to them, but uh, no. <laughs> you try to explain at home what you're doing? Or... Yeah, I mean, in some vague terms. I don't think they really got it, but that's okay. I mean, they were, they were happy with it. They, they didn't really need to know everything that was going on. So, you know, they saw, they saw I was uh, enjoying it and they saw that I uh, had a good time and traveling and uh, was, you know, respectable position and all that kind of thing. So I think they were pretty happy with it. I think my siblings, you know, they, they also thought it was nice, you know, because, um, you know, I'm from Detroit. They all stayed in Detroit. They, they left and came back, and I was the only one not to return to Detroit. So that, you know, is somehow a split in our family, but I think they, they looked up to that to some extent. So I think they thought that was good. Mm, so since you mentioned Detroit, and now you live in Germany, so you, as I guess many people in research, had to move to a different country or even continent. So how, how was that for you? 
Oh, that was great. I mean, you mentioned at the beginning this Humboldt professorship, which is, I mean, what, you know, in the end brought me to Germany, but um, I had a lot of contact with people in Germany before that with, uh, you know, Eckhart Wieweg and Elaine No. Met them back in the uh, early 80s at a really nice conference in Italy. And, um, you know, we stayed in contact and I visited them quite a lot. Uh, they visited me once or twice. We had a nice trip to Colorado at one point, which kind of <laughs> turned in some strange directions, but uh, that was fun. And um, yeah, we had a lot of good times together. And um, so I would visit them in Germany and um, this opportunity for the Humboldt came up. I mean, it was basically arranged by Eckhart and Elaine. Um, you know, they saw it as a nice opportunity and um, it worked out and um, it was, you know, great for me because it uh, gave me the opportunity to um, come here and be quite free in terms of my research and also gave me much more opportunities for um, putting together a group of postdocs and uh, PhD students much more than I had when I was at Northeastern. There was much more difficult to do that. Mm -hmm. So that worked out really well. And as you know, my wife uh, Uta is originally from Essen. So uh, that worked out well for her. And you know, with my uh, daughters, they like it here a lot. I don't think they have any interest in returning to the US, at least permanently, maybe for a visit or two, but um, they're not really their uh, lives are are continuing in Germany, so pretty much they'll they're gonna bury me here. I guess that's how, <laughs> how it's gonna end up. You know? right. we, are, we don't have the plot yet, but um, <laughs> looking around for one. <laughs> <laughs> so really, really. This means that uh, your daughter have been raised uh, bilingual, right? Oh yeah. Yeah, so uh, my wife Uta took care of that to uh, a large extent. I mean, we would, when we were living in uh, Boston, outside of Boston, then uh, the rule was to speak German at home, which uh, was good for me. So I did that. But then when we came here, the, my role switched. I was told I should speak English. So I tried to do that as much as possible. And um, yeah, I mean, they were raised bilingually, and I think they feel comfortable in both places, but they're still, they want to stay in Germany, it seems. Cool. So speaking German at home for you was okay. Some people feel tired from that. I actually don't no, know. I, no, I mean, it is, oh, it's enjoyable for me. It's a lot of fun. Of course it's, I mean, I do remember, um, especially, I mean, <laughs> there are all these kind of funny stories about my mistakes in German, but, um, you know, so it was a long, I, I never really, learned it in any formal sense. I'm not really very good at language. It's a very slow process. And as you say, it's very tiring, especially, you know, you're at a party and have a beer or two and then uh, gets late at night and the effort of, you know, understanding a foreign language is, it, it is an effort and it really uh, makes you tired. So I do remember like falling, falling over, or not really falling over, but, you know, barely keeping my eyelids open and then, uh, then Eckhart would notice this and switch the language to English and I'd wake up again. So <laughs> it, it, makes a, it does make a big difference. But you know, my, my uh, German skills have slowly increased over the years, let's put it that way. I think your German is pretty good. <laughs> yeah, well, written German still requires a lot of work, a lot of work, so. <laughs> Yeah, how about you? I mean, you, you're, you're fine in English, right? You find it tiring or? I think first couple of years, I was very frustrated with not being able to, to be funny in English because mm -hmm. there would be a conversation and I would want to say something, well, supposedly funny, and, but I would have to translate it in my head. And by the time I would be ready to say my, not the best, but you know, some joke, the time in the conversation would be gone. So I would always feel like I'm too late to say anything funny. This was very frustrating. Oh, yeah. But now, but then, now you're over that. No, no, I just lowered my expectation of what <laughs> humor is. So I just like switched to stup more stupid jokes. And then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> more the American style than the stupid jokes. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> but yeah, I think it's very important to be able to be funny if, if you need that. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's true. But I remember, um, 
was this? There was a, I went to a pottery school at one point and there was a guest potter there who was from, uh, I think Japan or Korea, maybe Japan. And um, his English was, you know, fairly minimal, but he would come out with these great jokes, but very simple. He'd make these really funny comments, but they'd be very, very simple. So he, he obviously had a really great sense of humor if he could um, bring that across in a language which he wasn't too expert in. So it's not always the expertise in the language that's needed for a good joke. Okay, I guess I should ask you some questions about doing math, otherwise people will be confused. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so right. let's see how that goes. What do you think are the most important skills for, uh, for doing research in math? Oh, for doing research. Oh, yeah, I mean, it varies from person to person. Everybody's different, right? Everybody, uh, you know, plays to their own strengths. Some people are um, technically really great and they can power through anything and other people um, have a very broad vision and that guides them and uh, other people, yeah, just do what they can. I'm kind of a do what you can type of guy. So whatever comes along, I try and do it. And so what's important? Maybe obsession, maybe that's a thing. You, um, it's not something you can choose to do, right? You either get obsessed by something or you don't. It's not like say, okay, I'm gonna get obsessed by this problem, you can't do that. But it seems to be that's, that's kind of what's, for me, what's necessary. If I don't get obsessed by it, then it doesn't go very far. And if I do get obsessed by it, then I'll hang on to it and uh, something hopefully will come out of it. I think that's sort of the driving force. It's like, you can't eat, you can't sleep. It, <laughs> it drives you crazy. And then you finally, uh, you get it done and you say, thank God I got rid of that one. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's, it's a little painful. I got, my, I think my first, uh, yeah, big theorem, I proved this result, which was like, uh, was proved by Suslin at roughly the same time, it was like a, um, you know, McCurry of Suslin theorem, weight two, but for K3. And this was, uh, you know, I was a young, young guy then and I you know got obsessed by this and worked on it really hard and I was really happy with it and uh, at that time I was in Berkeley and I think I was uh, smoking at that time I don't smoke anymore but I was smoking and um, not too much but you know enough and I, I got really sick I mean at the end of it I was really I got this uh, close to pneumonia or something and uh, yeah so it was uh, you know not good for my health, but uh, that's that's what it led to. But you know, I finished the problem. Is there anything that can help one to get into such obsessed drive about a math problem, or it just either happens or not? I think it's. I don't know if everybody gets like that. I mean, I know I do. Um, sometimes, not all the time, but um, like I said, I, you can't choose your obsessions. I don't think it either happens or it doesn't. I mean, it's just part of your personality if you get obsessed about things. I mean, I get obsessed about other things too. It's not just mathematics. Like if I can't find something, it drives me crazy, right? You can't find your keys or whatever, or that, you know, coffee cup you always use or and <laughs> go crazy until you actually find it, right? I don't know if you're like that, but my father is like that. <laughs> yeah, see, that's it. It dry, you know, it's it's probably built in. There's some kind of obsessive aspect to your personality, and it, sometimes it's useful, right? I mean, <laughs> oh, it's very useful to have such a person at home, one person. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> I yeah. see. Uh, so, Mark, I wonder you have lots of PhD students and had throughout the years. So would you in general support every PhD student to continue in academia or you would possibly advise against sometimes? Well, yeah, I don't know about advising against it. I think there are, I've had students who, um, well, I think the ones that stay with it, I, I think it's good that they stay with it. They're, they've, of course, there's been a big range of people's uh, abilities and skills and what they've done with things. I think some people, um, I've had, you know, pe people who started with me who just didn't finish and went off. And, uh, you know, 
it's not not for everyone. It's not always a great choice. And of course, if, you know, it's a little bit of a disappointment when people don't uh, continue, but um, not too much of a disappointment. I don't know if I've ever advised people not to go into mathematics. I don't think I've ever done that. I think it's it's somehow, I mean, if I don't think anybody's, nobody's asked me if they think they should really, well, people have asked me and I've encouraged them. Yeah, there've been a couple, couple of people who have asked me and, you know, I was happy to encourage them. So I don't think I've ever encouraged anybody really falsely, let's put it that way, <laughs> where I really thought this guy really should not be doing this. <laughs> That's not, that hasn't happened. So it's been more a positive encouragement, which I think in the end, uh, the results justify the encouragement, so. So I'm asking because uh, over the last say, 10, 20 years, the job market has become harder. So uh, I wonder if it's a good thing that uh, advisors mostly encourage their physicians to stay in academia, whereas then people are complaining that there is not enough. Yeah, no, it's a good, it's a good question. I don't know. It's hard. The thing is, as an advisor, you put a lot of uh, effort mm -hmm. into it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, like I said, it's a little, it, it is disappointing if, uh, you know, just from the, per it's a selfish thing, I guess, right? If you put the effort into it and you want the people to uh, make something out of it. It's also, I don't know how bad, you know, maybe, maybe you're right that the job market is difficult, but so far, pretty much, I mean, all of my students have, e have either gotten a position somewhere or, you know, if it doesn't work out, then they've gone into other things and they seem to be okay with that also. So I don't know. I mean, it's a difficult question. Could you roughly describe what are you looking uh, for in a PhD student, which, um, how do you decide who is? Yeah, I mean, I'm looking for someone who's, who looks like they're smart. <laughs> right? <laughs> looks like they can do it. And, you know, and either they, you know, they should have a fair amount of background or look like they can acquire background pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. and that they're, you know, interested in doing it, that they really want to do it. Because I, I don't want to have to, you know, drag somebody across the finish line. So uh, you mentioned an important aspect I wanted to ask you about, this thing about putting a lot of effort and then possibly getting disappointed with the outcome. So I was wondering that when I was doing a PhD, I could come to your office like almost every day, which is a luxury, I know, and like ask you lots of math questions. And you always found time to, to chat about math and whatnot. And I mean, okay, I was very thankful, but also surprised. It looked like you were never afraid to give too much in the sense that, I mean, you know, you don't know what a person will do later. Like maybe they, you know, start a YouTube channel. And <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a joy. It's fun to do. That's, that's you know. It wasn't a, um, yeah, it wasn't like a duty or anything. That's the, you know, it's, it's enjoyable to talk uh, mathematics to people and to, you know, tell them things that I know about and pass it on. I mean, it's a real, that's a lot of fun. So it wasn't, wasn't, um, wasn't work. Oh, so what is work? What is work? Yeah, I mean, eh. Uh, well, I mean, there's, you know, all the bureaucratic stuff that goes behind it, that's work. And, um, you know, it's, it's work if, um, yeah, it's work if, uh, what's work? Not too much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's pretty, pretty easy life. Not too much. Uh, not too much on the minus side. What's work? I mean, no, I mean, work is you know, like writing reports and uh, that's a kind of a duty, you know, for uh, referee reports and that kind of thing. Um, it's work. I mean, it's, it's necessary. You have to kind of support the papers that are good and tell people about the papers that aren't so good. 
that kind of thing. But it's that's a that's a lot of effort. I mean, you have to actually read the papers and more or less understand them, find out you know read them critically and find out what's wrong. You know, is there something really wrong in there? Are they right? It's not so. So that's a that's quite an effort. I mean, you learn things also. You you know you get in touch with the literature that way with things you might not have read. So it has an upside, but it, that's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. So while you're speaking about an easy life, I remember that I've hardly ever seen someone working as much as you or like having as many duties. I mean, all the grants and con organizing conferences and stuff and like having a huge research group and lots of PhD students and lots of projects. I had never no idea how do you do all that. And somehow you also managed to put out papers in the archive all the time. So when and how do you write those papers? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, like I said, there's, I don't know. Uh, well, writing a paper, you have to first come up with what you're going to write about and then figure out how to do it. And that you can do anywhere. I mean, it's not really, it's just, you know, like on the bus or um, whatever. I mean, that kind of, you know, thinking time is, is free. I mean, it's, it's kind of, it's all, always there, right? You can do it, you know, like you wake up at three in the morning and you're thinking about something or whatever. I mean, you know, like I said, the obsession part, it keeps you up at night. But I do that less now. I kind of sleep more now that I'm getting older. But yeah, I mean, the time, then the actual writing, once you've kind of thought through what you're going to do, well, that that's kind of the nice thing. The writing is a different phase. It's, it's uh, kind of a conversation with yourself when you test out the ideas that you had and see, oh, it doesn't quite work out the way I thought and it's uh, more complicated. I have to, you know, shore up this point and that point, but that's another, you know, that's kind of an enjoyable task as well. Figuring out exactly what's, what's right and what's not right. So, no, I mean, I don't know. It's just, there's time for that somehow. Do you have any life hacks for time management? What's that? Do you have any life hacks for time management? No. <laughs> I'm really bad at that. No, no, no. Uh, time management. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> put off the th put off the things that you think don't need to get done. I guess. <laughs> if you put it off long enough, then won't need to get done. Maybe that's one. <laughs> Other than that, I don't know. I don't know. Well, that's a good one, actually. Yeah. Very good. Um, okay. So another thing which I always wondered about your advising and in general discussing math, that um, it was always great that I could feel myself and say any nonsense and you never looked judgmental. Like even if, if one asks you maybe not the smartest math questions, you never show any condescendence or anything. So how do you manage to not be judgmental at all or not show any judgment? Well, it's, I'm really happy to hear that because a lot of people would complain about me being condescending. I mean, I have <laughs> maybe the undergraduate, more of the undergraduate students. Maybe, <laughs> I can't tell you the quote because I once got into a, a argument with one of my neighbors back in uh, Boston. And she came back with um, <laughs> with quoting what one of my students, you know, they have these online, these things on the web where students rate their professors. Yeah. And I, I can't say actually what she, she said in our discussion <laughs> here in this interview, but she said, you know, your students were right. You really are a... <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Well, so all I can say is I'm glad glad that didn't come across with with you and um, you know anybody certainly at 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 a level of a PhD student um all you know I've never had the case where this where the questions were annoying or anything like that it's it's they're usually reasonable questions. So. 
surprised about the undergrad. <laughs> I heard that it's a terrible website, though. People write terrible things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't look at it. <laughs> I think after she told me that, I looked at it once and I said, no, I'm not going to look at this again. That's enough. <laughs> I, I was always under an impression that when there is any like math or especially geometry going on, that you're like moving through those jungles of geometry on the fast speed. How, how, how does that work? <laughs> like other people have part of time imagining any geometry? Um, I don't know. It's just to help to how to, how to think about things. I mean, in a very vague way, I'm not, there, there are people who are much better at algebraic geometry than I am. Certainly I'm not really an expert in algebraic geometry in that sense. I mean, it's, I mean, some people think in different ways, I guess. Some people think, you know, in terms of algebra, and um, some people think in terms of pictures. I always, I find it, you know, if I can think of a picture of how things work, that guides me to figure out what I have to actually compute more explicitly. Seems, seems to be, but I mean, I don't really have any great uh, geometric intuition in the, in the deeper sense, just like you know, curves intersecting in the plane, they, they cross at points or sometimes they're tangent, that's, you know, <laughs> it's a picture. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's, that's one tool you use to think about a problem. You kind of simplify it and think about it in some kind of picture and then you can go from there. And, you know, certain things like you get used to just working in a certain framework you know, the framework in algebraic geometry is different from the framework in, um, you know, differentiable manifolds or something. What, what, you know, usually happens is different in those two different settings. And, you know, if it, after working in an area for a while, you kind of absorb what usually happens and what you can count on and what, what is uh, difficult or what is um, tricky. And, um, you know, it just, after some years, then it just kind of gets into your bones, I guess. So maybe that's that's what that was coming out. It's just you know, having dealt with the subject for for, I mean, by the time we were together, you know, you as my, my PhD student, I all you know, how many years after my PhD was that? It was like forty years or something after my PhD, or thirty years, thirty years probably, yeah. So I learned something in those 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, nevertheless, when you discuss math with other people, I always wondered, do you realize that you think much faster than like an average person you discuss math with? So it's hard for them to follow. <laughs> oh, no, no, I didn't realize that. No, because I, I think that about all the other people I discuss math with, that they're thinking much faster than I am. Oh my gosh, is that the reason that you speak so fast and explain math so fast? <laughs> really? Yeah, oh. I mean, they, yeah, I mean, everybody else, it's, I remember like Yerji Veyman, he would come, we would discuss things and he, he's incredibly fast. And he see, you know, maybe it's just that uh, people working in their own areas take a lot of things for granted. I think maybe that's what it is. Terrible, Mark. <laughs> I thought I was slow. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> Anyone who has been at your talk is now laughing <laughs> and crying at the same time. <laughs> well, you know, I have no. to slow down, I guess. Very fast. You already mentioned a little about it, but I still wonder, what are the biggest challenges in mathematician's job in your opinion? biggest challenges oh I don't know I mean always moving forward I guess always you know you work on a project and it's done and then you have to think of something new I mean it's um, that's the struggle I guess that's the maybe the biggest challenge coming up always you know keep moving forward it's not so easy and um, yeah, I don't know. Biggest challenge. You have to always prove new theorems, I guess. That's the challenge. <laughs> have, have you been in a situation where you didn't know what to do next? 
Awesome. Yeah, always. That's what happens, you know, if you finish, if you work on some project and you finish it, then you go, okay, what do I do next? No idea. And then? Yeah, then you get an idea. <laughs> it always comes, something, something will always turn up. But um, yeah, I mean, it gives you a, it, sometimes it's nice, right? You, you finish something and then you can kind of sit back and, um, you know, think about things you hadn't thought about before, look into new areas. It's kind of fun, you know, it's like learning a language. It's always fun in the beginning, right? You have a very steep learning curve in the beginning and then it gets difficult. So it's nice to um, get into something where you're at the steep learning curve. Range. Yes, but to get to the moment where you can actually prove a new result, don't you have already to be like far away on that curve? Far not necessarily, not necessarily. Really? Especially if you, yeah, I mean, if you come at something from a different, like if you, if you get into an area where people have been working, of course, yeah, I mean, it's, you can't just, you know, get into something and tell pe people, well, you've been doing it all wrong. This is how you do it. <laughs> Usually it doesn't work. But often, if you come into an area from a different area, it's not too far, too different, but, you know, different enough. And the people who are working in this new area can come from a different perspective, then sometimes the new perspective gives you a, a lever that is new, and then you can take advantage of that sometimes. I mean, it's, I mean, if you, I've, if you go after the goals that everybody else is going after, of course, they're going to be ahead of you. So sometimes you just seek different goals, right? Think, think of questions that other people maybe weren't so interested in or hadn't thought of or just get a new perspective or a different perspective on something. And okay, it may not, not be the problem that everybody is trying to solve, but maybe it's interesting nonetheless. Mm -hmm. So on the practical level, how does one find a problem? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you look around, I don't know. Uh, yeah, how do you find a problem? Yeah, it's a good question. That's a problem. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's not, like I said, you know, you can find the problems that have been lying around, like you could say, okay, I'm going to work on the Hodge conjecture, that's a problem. But, um, you know, your chances of success are maybe not so high. So that's, that's the problem. I remember this is Maurice Auslander's uh, advice is that you have to find a problem that um, you can do, but not everybody else can do. <laughs> Does it become easier with experience or not? Hmm. Yeah, I, yeah, yes and no. I mean, if you're young and inexperienced, then you don't know how hard the problem is that you're trying to solve. You have a psychological advantage. So like I said, you know, the Hodge conjecture, right? If you've never heard of the Hodge conjecture and maybe it just occurred to you, this question, maybe, it, you know, and then maybe it occurred to you because you had some insight into why it might be uh, true or false or something, right? And so if you come in naively sometimes to a problem, sometimes you have an advantage. Whereas if you've been working you know, 30 years in some area, you know what the hard problems are and maybe you tend to stay away from them. Or you're afraid of them. I mean, there's a, there's a great deal of fear of psychology in the story, right? I mean, if, you, if you're afraid of a problem, then you're not gonna really, it's hard, it's hard to uh, say, I'm gonna, you know, like Andrew Wiles, I'm gonna spend the next 10 years working on uh, Fermat's theorem. So um, that's, you know, it's psychologically difficult. So sometimes, you know, the experience helps and then you can formulate some new problems. So and sometimes the naivete helps. But 
if you're new, you ask people around and they tell you, oh no, that's a hard problem. And then. Yeah, yeah but maybe you shouldn't ask people. Maybe you just go for it. Just do what you, you know. I see. I'm now more confused about finding problems than before. This yeah, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's really, I, I, I don't know how to give any advice for that. They just come out of nowhere. Oh, I remember what I wanted to ask. So uh, when you graduated yourself and became a postdoc, so perhaps sort mm -hmm. of dependent, were you afraid that you wouldn't find enough math problems to work on? Oh, let's see. I have to think back. Um, maybe. I mean, I did change direction quite drastically um, sort of early on. Um, I mean, I, my, my advisor is Matsusaka, and he came out of sort of classical algebraic geometry. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I mean, it was just sort of accident. And I, um, although we did do a lot in our seminars on, on uh, algebraic cycles and studied a lot of uh, Spencer Block's works. And uh, my first job was at uh, UPenn and um, Srinivas was visiting there. And he was really into algebraic cycles and algebraic K theory, which I never really had much uh, knowledge of. And um, he's very, you know, engaging guy. He's really fun to talk to. And he got me interested in these things. And he said, "Oh, this is a great area because it's it's new, and so there are lots of easy theorems lying around." So, <laughs> so that sounded good. So yeah, I mean, that's like I said at that you know at that point, I just picked up whatever came along. And so that's what came along. So um, I think that's how, I mean, in, in that sense, he, he um, was in this area of K theory and cycles on singular varieties. So there it was kind of easy to find a problem because you say, okay, what's, what do we know about K theory and algebraic cycles on smooth varieties and what could be true on a singular variety? Could the same thing be true? How do you have to modify things? So it's kind of an easy uh, transition, right? The problems are, the questions are there, right? And then you just kind of try and adapt them. It's not maybe really deep mathematics, but it's gets you started. So that, that was a good source of problems, just going to a slightly, you know, more uh, restrictive area or more complicated situation slightly more complicated and you could just try and see what transfers from the simpler situation to this more complicated situation so there you have a ready source of problems yeah. what is deep mathematics yeah <laughs> anything that's too difficult for me to understand <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm not good at judging that kind of stuff. That's a good definition. <laughs> <laughs> so deepness changes every day then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mark, what's the silliest mistake you remember doing in research? Oh, silliest mistake. That's, um, or I remember a serious uh, big mistake, which was uh, when I was writing my thesis, I thought I had a nice result, which turned out to be it turned out maybe 30 years later to be false. Ooh. So this is okay. I mean, but so yeah, it was a question of if you take a smooth projective rational variety and take a small deformation, is it rational? And so now there are these beautiful examples. But uh, at the time, you know, I thought I had a proof and um, I was very happy about it and told people about it. And of course, um, didn't really write it up in detail, thought, thought I knew how to do it. And you know, I've written some sketches or something. And then I said, okay, well, I've done that. Now, what else am I gonna work on? So I was thinking about lots of other things, things about, you know, cu about uh, cubic hypersurfaces of higher dimension, you know, because I learned about three folds. So I was looking at four folds, five fold, things about that. And I remember just kind of walking down the street thinking about this, that, and the other thing and thinking a little bit about this argument that I used to prove this result, which was false. And, and I thought, well, what about this? What about this? What about that? And it felt like the, like the sidewalk had opened up under my feet because I realized that it, my argument was wrong. 
And uh, so that was a that was a mistake. Did you you saw it thirty years later or then? No, no, before before I graduated. Ah. Uh. So then I you know I rewrote the thesis to be a much less <laughs> impressive problem. So it wasn't a very good thesis in the end, but you know it's enough to get me out. But anyway, um, yeah. So I realized it before before my graduation. So that was good. But it was still quite a shock. I remember. Was it hard to get over it psychologically? Well, it was embarrassing because I told all these people about it. And they were very like my advisor. He was oh, that's a great result. <laughs> You know, interesting if true, kind of that kind of thing. So, and um, yeah, so it was embarrassing, but he was, he was good about it. So didn't have, didn't have too many serious consequences. I ended up getting a job afterwards. So it was okay. And, you know, moved on from there. I think that was, and I can't think of anything offhand, but I'm sure I've had other I remember some paper I wrote, started writing, I forgot, I can't remember what it was about, but I do remember that uh, the first lemma was wrong. So, <laughs> so the whole thing was worthless. <laughs> you know, it's like I'd written, I don't know how much I'd written, 10 pages, 20 pages, whatever. And like the first, the first step was wrong. So it was just trash, the whole thing. So that happens too. Oh. That's sad. Yeah. <laughs> mm. For some reason, it doesn't, it doesn't happen that often. Somehow. Some, I mean, the, the interesting thing for me is that very often the um, result that you think you've proven turns out to be right, even though the first proof was completely wrong. So, so there's something going on there where you... Um, kind of know that something, you know, for some reason that some, some structure is there or something's happening. And then you come up with a proof and then the proof is like all wrong. But then for some reason, it still, it still works out. That's kind of the miracle. I don't know why that happens. It seems to happen though, fortunately. I remember someone told a story that um, a more experienced mathematician is asking a younger one, when do you think you should submit a paper to the journal? And the younger one says, well, when you check and there are no mistakes. And the more experienced one says, well, no, that never happens. When you found already three mistakes and it's, you still managed to fix them all, then you can still. Exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Right. <laughs> So speaking of research, Mark, you've been working in motivic homotopy theory and people find this field quite obscure. Um, so is there any source, like a written text that you would recommend if people want to learn the basics? Oh, that's a terrible question. Yeah, it's difficult. <laughs> what do I recommend? I mean, there are lots of, um, well, what do I tell people? I tell people maybe to look at Morel Voyevatsky or look at some of Voyevatsky's. Yeah, that's, but not, I don't know if I'd look at it too seriously. I'd, I'd skim over it just to see what's what. It's difficult, it's a difficult paper. And um, yeah, I don't know. It's not so easy. Maybe what I'm having some of my students do now is just take some fairly recent papers and then you kind of work back from there. Like you kind of dig into the paper, like, um, and then, then you're kind of forced at each stage to learn what these people are talking about. So rather than saying, rather than starting at the beginning, that seems to, seems to me to be more effective. Uh -huh. So I don't know if it's so useful to try and learn everything from the ground up. I mean, I think it's impossible, essentially. So oh, I would just give up at the beginning and just start with something interesting and then see what you need to learn in order to understand uh, that paper. And then you'll have filled in some gaps, some, some foundations, and then move on from there. Keep doing that. 
I think that's that's really the only way to proceed. I see. I yeah. mean, I, I learned uh, homotopy theory because I was interested in K-theory. I mean, I didn't learn homotopy theory. I learned, you know, little bits and pieces of homotopy theory because I was interested in understand, you know, learning about K-theory. And, uh, you know, I learned bits and pieces about uh, theories and model categories because I was interested in learning about uh, motivic homotopy theory. And um, so it, that goes on like that. I have, I, you know, I'm starting to learn bits and pieces about infinity categories because people are using that. So I have to read their papers and get some, you know, hands-on feeling for what that is. So that's how it goes. I mean, the foundations are sort of what you fill in afterwards. <laughs> that's very <laughs> interesting. The beginning. But doesn't it, so I, I, I agree with you that I think this is a good strategy, but also, for me, it always feels like you're walking not on the ground, but on ice. So you're somehow like trying to balance on the icy you know, uh, surface. Uh, yeah, that's and, true. And sometimes it's just so wonderful to hope for a ground or to walk on, but it's never happening. Yeah, yeah. But then, then you see, okay, uh, when, you, when it becomes unbearable, when the icy feeling becomes unbearable, then you go back and, you know, shovel some concrete under it. <laughs> I mean, right, if you feel, right, as long as you feel comfortable with working with what you know, then it should be okay, and then, but there'll come a point, like you say, there'll come a point where you say, well, I've been using this all this time, why, why is this, I have no idea why this works, why this is true, I've just been saying it over and over again, maybe I should uh, go back and see why this works, right, so it's a, right, and then you go back and see why it works. So you filled in that, that bit of uh, foundation and then, okay, then you're happy and you go on until you, know, you find you're standing, you know, standing over the, the canyon with uh, only air under your feet. And then you have, to <laughs> 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 you have to go back and say, oh, I better <laughs> learn this stuff. <laughs> That's true. Um, so over the years, you've been observing not only math, developing but also math community perhaps had some changes in which it functions so would you comment on what you like or dislike about the changes happening if you... oh gee i mean this last couple last year has been so awful in terms of uh, i mean the, one of the nice things is is uh you know meeting people seeing people and that's been sort of awful this year but that's not really a development that's sort of a you know catastrophe, which uh, affected everybody, not just the math world. So, yeah, what's the development? I mean, of course, when, when I got my PhD, life was pretty easy in terms of um, what you needed in order to move on and get a first position and that type of thing. And we didn't really need too much. And I guess uh, the fact that people need to have written three papers before they um, finish their PhD in order to get a good position somewhere. It's kind of difficult. Don't scare off my viewers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's not really, not everybody needs to do that. <laughs> but um, yeah, sorry. But um, yeah, what's different? Well, yeah, I mean, there's you know, since I got my PhD, there were several recessions and each time the job situation would get worse for people coming out then, it was, you know, it's always very difficult when you, you're, well, in the United States anyways, when you uh, first enter the job market when you're in the middle of a recession, but somehow it seemed to never get back to the way it was before. You would always, you know, get much worse and then get a little better and then get much worse again and get a little better. So it's not so nice. Is it also what's going to happen now because of the pandemic crisis? Oh, maybe. I don't know. How can one have impact on the changes in the math community? How can one have impact? Yeah, okay. You have to be interested in having impact. 
people, some people are really, really take a lot of effort for this. I, don't, I myself don't, don't take much effort for this. I have to admit, maybe I'm a little lazy in that regard. So in the, you know, in the, in the political setting, I mean, what, what you can, I mean, you can do things in your own little area, like try, I mean, that's what I've tried to do is just try and get enough uh, funding that supports young people. That was the main goal. And so in that sense, I tried to do things in that regard and didn't really think so much about affecting the, you know, political path or that type of thing. I'm not too adept at that. So I just didn't try because I think I would be pretty ineffective at it. I don't Thank really you for being people. very effective at supporting young people. <laughs> yeah, so I tried to do that and I think that worked out pretty well, you know, in a small, if you look at the numbers of people, it's not so many people, but, you know, in a small garden kind of took care of that to some extent. So that was what I was trying to do in that regard. So it's not, it's not a major change in any direction of how society is going, but, you know, just within the framework of what's, what's here, then I try to do that. Thank you. Mark, I have a question for you, which I myself don't know how to answer, so you don't have to say anything either. But um, so well, it's um, I could surely say that you've been a very inspiring PhD advisor, and clearly people would say that you're a very inspiring mathematician. But I wouldn't know how to formulate what is mathematical inspiration. Do you have any clue? <laughs> oh, well, well, first of all, thank you very much for saying that. It's nice, nice to hear it. I don't. Yeah. But um, what's inspiring? I mean, that's, that's the thing. People, you get inspired by people who um, tell you things that are just amazing, I guess, right? <laughs> yeah. Some, you know, some people I think of like uh, Balenson or Deline or just people who have, um, you know, some vision some broad overall vision of how things fit together, how things should be, um, that's inspiring, I think. Mm -hmm. you know, people who can, who see, uh, yeah, I mean, who can see the, well, again, he uses the word deep, but it's, when, when they say it, it seems deep, I guess. <laughs> Maybe because I don't understand what they're talking about. So that's inspiring also. You know, when people say something that sounds really exciting, but you have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> and that's inspiring because you're inspired to learn what it is they're talking about. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So who's your hero in math? Yeah, I mean, uh, you mentioned those. There's the Spencer Block, of course. He's probably the hero. And let me ask you, uh, can you recall any funny episode that happened to you on the conference? <laughs> I'm really bad at recalling things. I always just come up in the middle of nowhere. So funny things that happen in conferences. Well, I mean, there, there was this nice story about when I first met Eckhart Nolen. I told you we met at this nice conference in Italy. Mm -hmm. And um, it was on... Uh, this uh, former, um, yeah, nunnery or something, right? It was a convent, former convent on the shores of Lake Como, beautiful setting. And it was, you know, took a, you go, I guess, first to Milan and then you take a train up to there. So it's this little train. You get off at this little station, there's nobody there, right? So I get off and they get off, they were, pretty far away in the train. So there's kind of off in the distance and we're on this train platform, completely empty. And I look at them and I think, oh, they must, those must be mathematicians. And Elaine told me, she looked at me, she says, oh, he must be an American. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it was exactly that made her think I was an American, but she was right. <laughs> Nineteen eighty-three. I was probably had a beard and like really scraggly hair at the time. Wow. 
yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's a reason that I don't have a beard now, which is because that's because of how it looked then. <laughs> <laughs> so. Mm. Mark, I don't have many more questions, but uh, can I tell you a story? Sure, love to hear a story. I think. So when I've just, okay, stories may be a too, an exaggeration, but when I've just graduated, uh, I was so overfilled with gratitude that I wrote a draft of a letter to you expressing all my gratitude and amazement. And then I thought, uh, I, I, th I was afraid to look too sentimental or something. So I've never sent a letter. And, oh, uh -huh. yeah. and, but now it's been a year of pandemic. I don't care anymore if something is too sentimental or not. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, I, I don't think that kills people anymore. Yeah. So um, let me tell you a little piece of that. Uh, uh, this is going to be embarrassing, but okay. I'll... Oh, well, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, for me, not for you. Embarrassing for me, but go ahead. <laughs> Maybe you find some joy. So what I wanted to tell you, uh, like a piece of that was that um, my mom is a language teacher. And so she started teaching me English early on when I was like five or so years old. And uh, she seems to be ambitious because she started with teaching me the famous poem, If by Rudyard Kipling. Mm -hmm. uh, I really liked, liked the poem. And to me, it was always some poem about some abstract um uh, human qualities which i have hardly ever met in life so i thought it's an abstract text about how you should aim to be but you don't really like a human being cannot be like as written there mm -hmm. uh, and then <laughs> I, when i met you some of the lines in the poem started making so much more sense to me <laughs> really? oh my god <laughs> yeah and i i know uh that's maybe ridiculous but um for example, when, when you give a seminar talk and people like complain that something is wrong and uh, you say, no, it's right. So I was thinking about the, the lines that um, <laughs> if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their <laughs> doubting too. <laughs> That's good. That's good. That's nice. And also, uh, I so your, your general manner of talking to other people uh so, so that like all of them always feel warm no matter who they are like colleagues or not so that finally showed me what the, what those lines meant about or at least that's how i interpret them that um if you can talk with crowds and keep your watcher or walk with kings nor lose the common touch um so i don't really know what common touch means but to me it's it's like i always imagine how you go to university menza and uh say like wish a good day to all the staff in the men's and they're also happy when you come by whereas other people just pass and you know, give the dishes away <laughs> so yeah. yeah those lines were making much more sense so i wanted to write about that and then <laughs> and well that's very that's very sweet of you thank thanks for telling me that and okay one more minute of your embarrassment is that <laughs> <laughs> the, the non-written letter was supposed i don't know to start or to end or Somewhere uh, there was a quote by Eldon, which I have forgotten, but yesterday I opened the text and I was reminded that apparently Eldon wrote after my graduation that uh, he has never met anyone who would have so much love for their advisor as I do. Oh, well, I hope you still feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, what can I say? Except it was, you know, a lot of, it was very uh, enjoyable, a great pleasure having you as a student. So thank you. What what more can I say? And thank you for suffering through the embarrassment by letting me say <laughs> what I <want> to say. <laughs> Mark, would you give um, as a last question any advice to young mathematicians? Um, advice to young mathematicians. Let's see. Uh, yeah, stay with it. Enjoy it. That's the advice. <laughs>